All this is Dr. Mobeen Sayed from drbeen.com. Welcome to one more show. So while we had been focusing on Omicron, there is so much important news that was happening. So I thought we would do a quick roundup of what is going on, especially the monoclonal antibodies. And today, FDA authorized Eli Lilly's antibodies for children under 12 as a passive immunity for protection, especially at-risk children. So I want to talk about that. Plus, there is a news about AstraZeneca's long-lasting monoclonal antibodies that they say are efficacious, almost as good as efficacy, about 83%, for six months. So I want to look at that report as well, because if that is the case, we we can just have Regeneron, Lily, and AstraZeneca. And there should be no reason for any further damage to humanity if these are given in time. So I wanted to look at all of that. Plus, I wanted to look at the chances of ADE with monoclonal antibodies or antibodies in general. So I wanted to show a couple of paragraphs. I always say that ADE does not happen with SARS-CoV-2, but I wanted to show some data, some text about that as well. In addition to that, there are some other news as well. One interesting news from Japan that, of course, there is a drastic uh, reduction in the cases in Japan. And there are many, many theories, including IVM. The one theory that was interesting for me was about the NSP uh, or the proofreader of the virus and the change in that. So there is a bunch of news that is going on, which is interesting. So I thought, let's get through those and be on the same page with the world. So let's start. I hope you have your coffees with you because these are the gifts for humanity at, guess where, at humanity's coffee shop. So here we are and let's start our discussion. So more than the drawings today, because there is just so much, that I'm going to go over some of the written text. And if there is something that you would like to be explained, just hopefully text me here and I would uh, draw it and explain it. So I'm going to start with this one. First of all, this is drbean.com. Uh, you can support my work by actually buying a plan as well. That is a good thing too. It's a lifetime access. <laughs> all right. So. British Medical General, and this is, I believe, 19 November 2021. So we are a little late. I remember reading this news. I wanted to discuss it, and then Omicron and some other such things started happening. So here, AstraZeneca's antibody treatment, AZD7442, reduces the risk of developing symptomatic COVID-19 when it is taken as a preventative measure. Prophylaxis. Prophylaxis. But it's not a prophylaxis for a month. Normally, antibodies that are called passive immunity, normally these are given for a month, two month type prophylaxis. Here we are talking about six months. So I want to quickly look at this data with you. So look at this prevention. The PREVENT phase three trial looked at the safety and efficacy of a 300 milligram injection of the AstraZeneca's monoclonal antibodies in unvaccinated people who did not have signs of previous SARS-CoV-2 infection, meaning they didn't, they didn't already have the uh, naturally acquired immunity. It was conducted across 87 sites in the US, UK, Spain, France, and Belgium with 5,197 adults, good size, randomized in a two to one ratio. So two got the monoclonal antibodies and one placebo. Check this out, the six-month assessment. And I'm, my apologies if you have already read it. For me, now I'm lifting my head up and looking at the things that I wanted to talk about and got derailed. The six-month assessment was based on 4,991 participants. I want to repeat it. This is a monoclonal antibody. This is passive immunity. This is not a vaccine. With data collected up to 29 August 2021, approximately 43% of participants were age 60 or over, and more than 75% had baseline comorbidities and other characteristics associated with an increased risk of severe COVID-19. The analysis found that one 300 milligram dose of AZD7442 
reduce the risk of developing symptomatic COVID-19 by 83% when compared with placebo. Important thing is this is prophylaxis. This is not handling the acute disease. That is, a person doesn't have to be exposed when these were given. These were just given. So, for example, to you or me, these are given today. And then the coverage with 83% efficacy continues for six months. The, they're calling them the long-lasting antibodies. They are modified. And the I think the other good news is that they are modified in also in a way that ADE's chances are not present. In the placebo arm, there were five cases of severe COVID-19 and two COVID-related deaths. In the uh, monoclonal antibody arm, there was no death. So you see here, there were no cases of severe COVID-19 or COVID-related deaths in participants treated with AZD7442. This is a great news. And uh, I'm sure that you know it. This is November 19. I am reading it and discussing it with you on December 6. So I am behind. Then look at the severe illness. For the severe illness, they gave 600 milligram of this. And then the other side was a placebo. The analysis found that at day 29 of AZD7442, reduced the risk of developing severe COVID-19 or death from any cause by 88% when compared with placebo in patients who had symptomatic for who were who had been symptomatic for three days or less at the time of treatment. This is powerful. Ideally, with these medicines available, I would actually, uh, as much as there are folks who really, really um, in the administration who really do not like things like ivermectin. Let's take malnupiravir, for example. Even with the efficacy of 50% or 53%, still that is a tool. We should look at all tools. And when you combine them, I find that there should be no reason for someone to become severe. At least that is... Remember, I had also been talking about Regeneron, that we should all be aware of Regeneron. This should be the standard of care. I will talk about Regeneron as well today as well. That is also a very powerful combination. So this is one. So take away over here, AstraZeneca's monoclonal antibody as a prophylaxis can provide prophylaxis for six months with 83% efficacy and provide protection from severe disease with 88% efficacy. Okay, so that's one. Second part, neutralizing monoclonal antibodies. After this article, I'm going to go to Lily's two monoclonal antibodies as well. So really we should call them biclonal because there are two monoclonals or polyclonal, but poly is usually more than two. Anyways, that is just semantics. Let's look at the antibodies. Antibody treatment is usually called passive immunity. The reason for that is that when it is given, patient is protected with these antibodies for as long as the antibody sits in the body. An antibody cannot sit there forever. It is not like a vaccine that would train the cells and then the vaccine is gone, but the cells are trained for the future attacks. Antibody, when you inject it, it will help as long as it is in the system. And our system does not like to keep foreign things in it for a long time. So normally it would degrade them and flush them within three weeks to six weeks. But these antibodies are slightly modified to prevent some of the destruction that can happen. So this, this is a very good article, generally for the passive immunization and huge number of pages, beautiful article. I wanna just go over some parts of it. These are first of all here. And this idea of ADE, of course, if we say there is ADE that happens and it happens in some cases, then if you give antibodies from outside, then that can also cause a risk of ADE. So here they talk about the risk of ADE with monoclonal antibodies. And they said there are two mechanisms. Remember, I have done a discussion where I discussed five mechanisms. Here what they did was they categorized it in two main ways. And I think I'll, I'll explain this with some drawings. So first of all, they're saying, 
pathogen specific antibodies so i'm going to draw them and explain their two points one they are saying that let's say this is an antibody and this antibody is pathogen specific that means so let's say here is sars-cov-2 and this antibody binds with the spike protein SARS-CoV-2. Now they say that antibodies, and this is a normal thing, antibodies have biological functions. In addition to that, antibodies, especially IgGs, these are the ones that are used as a passive antibody, they can be attached with the receptors, mostly on the immune system cells, for example, macrophages, dendritic cells, even other macrophages, dendritic cells, and even other cells, they have receptors to bind with antibody. And through the, these are called FC gamma receptors, fraction constant IgG. So this part of the monoclonal antibody or any antibody, this part is called fraction constant. This side is called fraction variable because this is variable for each antibody. But this side stays constant. So fraction constant connects with the receptor, FC gamma receptor, and through that, it can be taken into the cell. Usually it is phagocytose, it is not easy to go and liberate the virus, but this is one potential route for infection. Doesn't happen with SARS-CoV-2, but one potential route. The other potential way, so this is one. The other potential way is the following. When we have an antibody, so imagine this is an antibody. Imagine this antibody as a spaceship. So it is a spaceship that is flying around and it is just moving about. As soon as it docks with the, with the antigen that it binds to, as soon as it binds there, there is conformational change. There is a change in the fraction constant region and there are parts of it that opened up that open up. So imagine that there is this key that gets attached to the variable region. And as soon as that key is attached, there are various things that open up. So think about grinding sounds and everything and the doors opening. And there is this area that opens up on the constant part. This opening or, or exposure of the biologically active, biological activation sites they allow complement activation and they do various other biological functions. So the second possibility for ADE is that when you give antibodies, these antibodies would then go into the body. They will attach with the SARS-CoV-2, for example, in our case here. They would then open up their conformational, their biological activation sites which will then cause complement to become activated, which would then cause the immune system to become further enhanced, and that can cause uh, cytokine storms and immune injury. So these are two, they just use these two primary categories. When I did my talk, I talked about five mechanisms, but they just put them in these two broad categories. Then they say, what you can do is, if you want to avoid ADE, you can change for the antibodies from given from outside, you can change their fraction constant part that binds with the FC gamma receptor and make it unbindable. And that way now this antibody cannot be taken up because the antibody will not be bound to the macrophage. Similarly, you could make modifications here so that the biological actions are not that active that, that much. That is how you could help reduce the ADE. And some of the monoclonal antibodies have these kind of changes to them, some don't. With this, I wanna go back to this one here and talk about it. First, pathogen specific antibodies could increase infection by promoting virus uptake and replication in FC gamma receptor expressing immune cells. This is what they're talking about. But then they say, with SARS-CoV and SARS-CoV-2, 
in vitro evidence amassed to date indicate that these non-lymphotropic coronaviruses are unable to productively replicate within hematopoietic cells. So what he's saying is these guys do not actually infect the lymphoid tissue and they work with other cells, hematopoietic means blood cells. Because of this, they don't cause ADE. So that is one. And they have given various studies over here that have proven it that we don't see ADE. So that should put your mind at rest. And if you wanted to study more, you could go to this, for example, ref reference number 21 over here and go and read that study as well. Then the second part, in the case of respiratory virus infections, the resulting immune cascade can contribute to lung disease. So this is the, now they're talking about this, resulting immune cascade. When the antibody is in there, it binds with the antigen. That now starts an immune response, and that immune response can cause injury. While the hallmark of severe COVID-19 have features that overlap with this type of ADE, there is currently no definitive evidence to show ADE occurs with SARS-CoV-2 infection. And again, they have another study where they tried to prove it and they said, no, it does not happen. So that is study number 22. The point of this is antibodies are one, they can be changed to reduce the effect of ADE. And secondly, we haven't seen ADE. Now, I wanted to discuss two more things here in this article before we continued. And that is the Regeneron and Lilly's antibody. So here, these two antibody sets that you are seeing, these are the two polyclonal antibodies. They're still called monoclonal, incorrect. Polyclonal is incorrect as well. They are really biclonal. Clonal. These are two. One is from Regeneron and the other one is from Lilly. So this group here, Bamlanivimab and Atisivimab are from Lilly. And this group over here, IMDVimab and Casirivimab are from Regeneron. Now, Regeneron's antibodies, remember I talked about it in detail about an hour long talk. Regeneron's antibodies were produced by finding the best antibodies in convalescent plasma and also finding the antibodies produced uh, in recom with recombinant technology. So they produced thousands of antibodies. They then used them to attack the SARS-CoV-2 and then they found two best ones and then they made Regeneron from that. So these are these two antibodies, MDVMAP and Casirivimab. On the other hand, Lilly actually have these two guys, Bamlanivimab and Itacivimab, and they both can be, Bamlanivimab can actually be used separately or it can be used with Itacivimab. So I want to quickly show you about these as well. So if you see here, this is a very interesting one. This is for Itacivimab. Itacivimab binds the up active conformation of the RBD. What does that mean? When the receptor binding domain, remember on the spike protein, so let's say this is a spike protein. Spike protein has receptor binding domain area on it, correct? Imagine this is a virus with a hand. So normally the virus keeps the hand closed. So we say that is a down, down formation. It is in inactive state. Then when the spike protein is going to bind with the receptor, the RBD kind of opens up and this is called up formation. Now, ETCVMAP actually connects with the up formed spike protein. It doesn't matter, RBD. At the end of the day, when the virus is trying to connect with ACE2, these four antibodies, whichever is present, will interfere with the virus to connect. So they're giving some extra information over here that how does it connect with the RBD. So if you are interested, please read it. It's very interesting. Then I wanted to show one more thing, and that is, so Regeneron's antibody, two potent neutralizing monoclonal antibodies, 
namely Cassirivimab and Imdivimab. And these are IgG ones. Most of these are IgGs. Because IgG can connect with FC gamma receptor, IgG can start the biological actions. IgG are the good ones and durable ones. So these are two IgGs that are received from, or these, these are purified from convalescent plasma and the, and the recombinant or artificially prepared monoclonal antibodies. Then look at this one, BAM-Lenivimab monotherapy. Monotherapy is for outpatient patients, adults who may be at risk. BAM-Lenivimab was for them. And again, very good um, antibody. Look, it says derived from the convalescent plasma of a patient. So there was a patient who did very well, and so they took the antibody. The second one is itacivimab. And if I go here, before I go there, so here, to assess theoretical risk of ADE, bam lenivimab was studied in primary human macrophage and, and immune cell lines exposed to SARS-CoV-2 at concentrations down to 100-fold below the effective concentration for half maximum response. And in these studies, it did not demonstrate productive viral infection. So what they did was, what they're saying is essentially, bam lenivimab was used in vitro to see if it can cause ADE by increasing viral infection of the cells, and it was not found to do that. So that is also important. <laughs> Carol says, hi, Dr. Bean, have a cafe latte, cafe latte on me. Thank you. Sending love and support from Pennsylvania to you and your family, especially the felines. Thank you very much and love back to you as well. And Kate, thank you very much. Okay, so back here, this is a very, very important talk. And I see some questions here as well. Let me just make this one comment uh, about the other one as well, and then we continue. So that is about bam lenifimab The chances of ADE tried not happened. Good thing. We should not be sitting somewhere praying that ADE happens. Then, this is the bam lenivimab and itisivimab. This is the drug combina combination that is approved, not approved, authorized today by FDA for children under 12 years of age, especially those who may be at risk. So children with maybe cancers or immunocompromised or diabetes or other comorbidities. Very important thing. So other treatment arms of the BLAZE-1 trial studied bamlanivimab together with etisivimab. Now, what is etisivimab? An S-protein binding, IgG, with a modified FC region resulting in null effector function. So this antibody has this FC region. This region is modified. So that means when this antibody is given, it cannot generate macrophage functions or dendritic cell functions because it will not bind to their receptors. So all it can do is attach with the pathogen, sort of like a big vacuum cleaner, and start some biological actions by opening up the complement pathways, and that's it. It does not do this third function. So there is one function here connecting with the pathogen, kind of capturing it. Second function is opening up the pathway for complement activation and even activation of other proteins. And the third is to connect with the receptor to become, to help with the phagocytos, uh, phagocytosis. This is called opsonization. Opsonize, the coating opsonization, the coating of a pathogen is called opsonization with complement or antibodies. And then opsonized pathogens can be taken up by the, by the immune cells and destroyed. So this function does not happen. That also means ADE will not happen because the antibody is deliberately modified. Its foot that combines with the immune cell, that binds with the immune cell is modified. Okay, so that's a good news. So here is the ETCV map. bam lenivimab map and ETCV map together significantly decrease viral load. And then the, this continues for a long time. I'm going to now come in here. There were, I saw a couple of questions before I continue. If they're related to this part of the discussion, I'll answer them here. Okay, so Alex says, 
Dr. Ming, can you develop a tolerance or immunity to ivermectin by taking it every three days per the FFCCC protocol? No. And I would love it if we answer the <laughs> DDS. So we are remembering France today. We, thanks for the super chat, absolutely. Uh, let's see. Okay, so I'm gonna continue. I saw a couple of more questions that they have just kind of moved up. So please ask your questions again. I'm gonna continue, important talks are there. So <laughs> this, uh, I, I lifted my head up from the Omicron and there is just so much that is happening. Okay, so this is the next one. This is New England Journal of Medicine, BAM Lenivimab plus Itisivimab mild in mild or moderate COVID patients. So this is a study that actually um, I missed doing it. It's a late uh, a study that has been done a lot time earlier. A total of 1,035 patients underwent randomization and received an infusion of BAM Lenivimab, Itisivimab or placebo. By day 29, a total of 11 of 518 patients, 2.1%, in the BAM Lenivimab, Itisivimab group had a COVID-19 related hospitalization or death from any cause or compared as compared with 37, 37, their 11, 37 out of 517 patients, so 7% in the placebo group. Similarly, if you see here, no deaths occurred in the BAM Lenivimab, Itisivimab group. In the placebo group, 10 deaths occurred, nine of which were designated by the trial investigators as COVID-19 related. Last year, there were some politicians who became sick and they received Regeneron and they would come out of hospital within two days. Fortunately, now in the US, Regeneron can be available to everyone. Regeneron is very important. BAM Lenivimab is very important. Itisivimab is very important. So if you cannot get anything else, please keep an eye on this. And those folks who cannot get even these, and let's say internationally or in India, AstraZeneca's long-acting therapy is hugely important. So this is the other part. Then if I go in here, this is the BAM. So this is Lily's site. This is BAM Lenivimab emergency use authorization for treatment of post-exposure prophylaxis of COVID-19. So here, they're just talking about their drug. So treatment of mild to moderate symptoms. BAM Lenivimab has been for outpatient, for ambulatory patient, for patient who are walking into your clinic, getting the medicine and going out. They're not for the in-hospital. They're not for the patients who are outside of the viral phase. They're not for the patients who are in cytokine storm phase. And then today, this is today, December 3rd. We are here on December 6th. Lily's, so two, three days ago, Lily's BAM Lenivimab with Itisivimab authorized as the first and only Neutralizing antibody therapy for emergency use in COVID-19 patients under the age of 12. It is a very good news. Although, uh, I'll, I'll show it to you down here in this article, these also have their side effects. For example, allergic reactions are their side effects. So if I go down here, um, they talk about their... Uh, Cases. So I should have done what I do usually, and that is go over a trial and its uh, results. But today I just wanted to make sure that we can look at all of these. So treatment. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration has issued an EUA to permit the emergency use of the unapproved product BAM Lenivimab and Itacivimab administered together for the treatment of mild to moderate coronavirus disease in adults and pediatric patients including neonates, newly born, with positive results. This is very important. BAM Lenivimab and Itisivimab are not authorized to use in states, territories, and U.S. jurisdictions in which the combined frequency 
of variants resistant to bamlanivimab and etisivimab exceed 5%. So, of course, there can be mutations and those mutations can cause these antibodies not to bind. So, they are saying that those states and territories where such cases are occurring, they may not be able to use these anymore. The reason for that is that the more they will use it, even more resistance would develop. So the list is here. So if I open it quickly, just to have a glance. Hmm, interesting. So I would have really loved if I knew where they are not used, but they have said here are these authorized. So you can look at this list and see if it is authorized for your state. And please keep it in your mind. This is an important one. Okay. Use in patients who are hospitalized or who require oxygen. So when you see this notation here, the basic idea they're saying is that those patients that have moved away from the viral stage and are now in the cytokine stage, these antibodies are not going to help. So how are they defining that? BAM, Lanivimab and Etisivimab together are not authorized for use in patients two years and older who are hospitalized due to COVID-19. They are not authorized for use in patients regardless of age who require oxygen therapy and or respiratory support due to COVID-19 or require an increase in baseline oxygen flow rate and respiratory support due to COVID-19 and are on chronic oxygen therapy or respiratory support due to underlying non-COVID related comorbidities. Then post-exposure prophylaxis and they have that over here as well. Now important thing, there are limited so clinical safety, clinical data available for bam map and map together, serious and unexpected adverse events may occur that have not been previously reported with this together. Then warning and precautions, hypersensitivity, including anaphylaxis and infusion related reactions can occur. So that is an important one. If you see here, infusion related reactions occurring during or up to 24 hours after infusion have been observed. Fever, difficulty breathing, reduced oxygen saturation, chills, fatigue, arrhythmias, atrial fibrillation, sinus tachycardia, bradycardia, chest pain, discomfort, weakness, altered mental status, nausea, headache, bronchospasm, hypotension, and a lot. Consider slowing or stopping the infusion and administer appropriate medications or supportive care if an infusion-related reaction occurs. If allergic reaction occurs, provide support that is given for allergic reactions. So this is the therapy that has been approved. Now continuing, this is a note about the bam maps approval earlier. I'm gonna look here in the questions to see if there is anything I can answer right now before I continue. Colin says, if you got COVID-19, Wilson, I will mention, and it was fairly easy to get over because of RM, would that still give you natural immunity? Yes, always. Carol Sell says, so would Profimab be best for vaccine allergic and how would you develop immunity? So the prophylaxis, this is what they always say, monoclonal antibodies can reduce your ability to develop your own response. But most of the, the time, these are given to the patients who cannot produce their own response and they need external help. But let's say you are giving it to someone who is healthy and they just started it and you don't want to take a risk of a cytokine storm in them. You've given this medicine, uh, these antibodies, then it is possible that because the antibodies are going to go in and mop up the virus, your body will not have enough chance to react to the virus. And so your response could be weak. This is like a small dose vaccine. So because of that, your body would still know, but it may not have such a strong reaction in the future. It's a good question. Professor Mike is saying, you should be suing these, those doctors and hospitals to give IV bamlanivimab to a wider range of patients in the year. 
Okay, so there is some side discussion going on. Erica says, opinion of prednisone for a fashion thing sickness. Uh, I didn't catch the question, Erica. My apologies. Fred says, you're a hero, Dr. Bean. Thank you very much. Um, my city, Redding, California, just announced monoclonal antibodies available here now. Just one thing, though, $980 upfront. We have to try for reimbursement from insurance on our own. Sure, want to help. That is such a bad thing that our insurance system and payment system is not working correctly with this situation. So a uh, swordman says, have there been any monoclonal antibodies other than lidonlimab that have been trialed or been effective for critical patients? I am not aware of this. If there are any monoclonal antibodies against SARS-CoV-2, then they would not be trialed during the acute cases. Lidonlimab-like things are actually not targeted at the virus, but they are targeted at the immune system. So there may be other antibodies that are targeted at the immune system but not these kind of antibodies. Okay, so let's continue. Next, next topic. Next topic is the Omicron variant appeared to spread between two fully vaccinated people in separate hotel rooms in Hong Kong, early research suggests. So that's very interesting for me. They, there were two people in Hong Kong who were quarantining. The, the hotel was for quarantine. There were two separate people. And the Omicron infected one person who was across the room from another person who had Omicron. So of course, this doesn't, this sounds like magic, but at the end of the day, this is aerosolized or through the air. And we know that, although saying this, that somehow Omicron becomes more efficient in, in moving through the air, that is not correct. It must be something to do with the load. It must be something to do with their own air uh, distribution system. But this is an interesting one that Omicron went across the rooms so that means people who are staying at the hotels they may be at risk airborne transmission across the corridor is the most probable mode of transmission they wrote that's very interesting okay so i'm going to continue rare heart condition triggered by covid vaccine is a mild uh, is mild and resolves quickly says scientist i know that this is going to get me lots of uh, heat here from the folks but really i am presenting what is being researched i am also aware of the heart conditions and deaths that have occurred a rare heart related health condition induced by the covid-19 vaccine is mild and resolves quickly according to scientists so what they did was they had a group of experts from across the us reviewed 139 cases of vaccine induced myocarditis in people aged 12 to 20 with the average age being 16, 9 out of 10 cases were in boys and after second dose. Of the 139 people who went to hospitals with the complaint, less than 1 in 5 were admitted to intensive care and none died. Chest pain was an almost ubiquitous symptom and 1 in 3 people suffered shortness of breath or fever. So that is an interesting discussion. I thought you should be aware that this is also a newer thing. Now, this is interesting. New research suggests Delta strain should be called variant. Delta variant drove itself to extinction in Japan. This was very interesting to read. So here is what they said. And again, this is a theory. This is not a fact. This is a professor there who has this hypothesis for what caused the cases in Japan to go down drastically. Let's actually look at the cases. So if I go here and I say my word in our world in data, my apologies, my keyboard is so loud.
look at this and yes uh, we're going to have a lot of discussion some folks would say this is ivermectin some folks would say this is overwhelmingly great number of vaccination some say it is vaccination plus ivermectin plus masking plus the behavior there are so many factors i cannot discuss them i do not have the scientific data available to discuss them but there is a theory that is interesting so i thought from a mechanism point of view that is a cute theory and we should look at it the the reason they're saying well look it just dropped it went up very high the cases and then they just dropped what happened and so a professor in Japan had this theory, and I'm going to share that theory with you. They are saying, and some good drawing time, they are saying that the virus, so let's say this is a cell. In this cell, when the virus appears and it makes its messenger RNA available to the virus, and then it attaches to ribosome, and the messenger RNA, so when it becomes attached to ribosome, this messenger RNA would start making more, uh, first it would make a polyprotein. Polyprotein is like a big protein. It's a big chunk of meat. <laughs> it's a protein, not meat, <laughs> but it is a protein. Meats are protein too. And it has those little enzymes built into it, like tiny cutouts. And then you can press them out and, and have them work. But on the edge of this little polyprotein, on the edge, there are two enzymes that just fall off automatically. And one of them is RDRP. The other one is 3-chymotrypsin-like protease, 3 CTLP. These are the two. So imagine if there is a tiny, delicate paper and one corner of that paper is already torn. And it just needs a little touch to fall off. That is what it is. So these little protein pieces are just ready to be removed. So once this polyprotein comes together, these two guys, RDRP and 3CTLP, they separate. And their function, I discussed this this morning as well, the RDRP then, RNA-dependent RNA, protease. Its function is to pick up the original template RNA attached to that and make copies. Now they're saying that this RDRP in delta was getting mutated and it was accumulating more and more mutations. For example, let's say in delta the RDRP looked like this. Then another delta variant sub-delta variant, some daughters, their RDRP looked like this. Then the variant, the daughters of this variant, they had RDRP that looked like this. So it is accumulating mutations that are eventually going to make it useless. So, so far, Delta doesn't know it. And the things are happening. This is a proof. So, sorry, I should not say RDRP. They said proofreader. So, same mechanism, but I have to change the uh, enzyme. Sorry. I totally went in the wrong direction with the enzyme. So NSP14. NSP14, so let's just say. NSP14 is not... Let me put the RDRP back. So one of these enzymes is NSP14. NSP14 is the proofreader. So they are saying that the proofreader started accumulating these mutations. So with these mutations in the proofreader, the one that is quality assuring guy, that one guy, that guy is becoming damaged. And so slowly it is accumulating more and more modifications, mutations, to the point that it became useless. So as, so this is a theory. There are more factors. There are masks and the vaccines and the IVMs and, and, hemostat mesylate and a lot more but this is an interesting theory this is the first time i'm hearing a theory with the proof reader mutation so they're saying that as these kept um, accumulating newer and newer generation of the virus were lesser and lesser capable of of doing quality assurance to their genome 
because a proofreader himself was getting damaged and finally it became a useless variant and that is how delta committed suicide or self it, it imploded or drove itself to extinction so all those are good things that happened but it is an interesting theory proofreader itself got <laughs> and there is no proofreader for the proofreader okay so then continuing today they, this one is one of the most rich in, with information talk today so this one this is the covid outbreak on cruise ship approaching new orleans i do not know if it could be called outbreak but what they're saying is that there is a cruise ship that has 3200 people on it and 10 of them have positive they are positive for covid now so they they're saying that as the ship reaches they're going to test everyone so there may be more and everyone there was a there was a protocol that everyone on the ship must be uh, vaccinated so the us center for disease control and prevention issued a no sail order in march 2020 prompting a standstill that ended last june as cruise cruise ships began to leave us port ports with new health and safety requirements according to norwegian website the company requires all passengers and crew members to have been vaccinated against the virus at least 2 weeks prior to departure so the immune sh system should be in an active state anyways it doesn't look like an outbreak maybe there are people with the comorbidities maybe there are people with some weaker immune system out of 3210 so anyways this is some something that was people were sending me i don't think this is an outbreak but we'll see as it arrives and they'll do more tests on it then this was interesting woman wins court battle over treating her husband's covid-19 with ivermectin that was just the beginning so unfortunately this person is the order in response to darla smith's petition to compel the hospital to administer the drug to her husband of 24 years was to some kind of confusing so not only he got it so that is the good news but they took so many days just arguing so that was that and then finally this is japan so these are the discussions for today uh, let's see if there is duck says are they sick i don't don't know if they're just positive you're correct and they were vaccinated then so what but uh, we'll see more denise says what about the norwegian christmas party 100 out of 120 tested positive for omicron only vaccinated invited and look we have done this discussion before omicron as well that vaccination and testing positive can happen so no, not that i am saying it is good thing or a bad thing i'm just saying that that can be possible All right, so tomorrow morning, I have a surprise for you. We will have a talk tomorrow morning, 9 a.m. Pacific time. And I think you will be pleasantly surprised for who my guest will be. Okay, so, um, and in the honor of that talk tomorrow, I will only do this talk today, and then we will break and we will meet again in the morning. Suda says, I heard they aren't sick. And if they aren't sick, then sure. The, the, there is a risk with that, and that is a vaccinated person who becomes positive, is not sick, will be giving it to others around them, including those who are not vaccinated. And similarly, asymptomatic unvaccinated can spread, meaning the spread just happens. <laughs> Who is Dr. John? Carol says Dr. John. 
<laughs> not fudgy no okay so i'll give you a hint this is uh, i wanted some some good doctors from south africa to join me to give us some idea of what is happening on the ground so <laughs> who said not fair <laughs> janet says no fair i think you you would like actually that person has not been a guest here before so this would be their first time okay so this is where we are at thank you very much please like like subscribe and share and if you would like to support this work there are three links in the description you can buy me a coffee or you can become a patron or you can use paypal thank you very much and with your permission i would take off from the chit chat so that we can meet in the morning as well. So Denise says what time tomorrow? The, this talk that I'm talking about, that will be 9 a.m. Pacific tomorrow. Cool. So should we break now? Do you promise to share this? <laughs> all right. How long is this? 51 minutes. I think not all will share. All right. So I will see you tomorrow morning. Bye-bye for now.